So when we talk about confidence interval, right? For instance, if I tell you that uh, my odds ratio or my relative risk, either one of them, right? Say my odd ratio comes out to, as you mentioned, comes out to 1.2, right? 1.203, let's say, right? With a 95% confidence interval of 0 0.860 to 1.147. Okay, well, odds ratio tells you the difference between, or relative risk, it gives, tells the difference between the risk for people, risk or odds, for people who are exposed to, say, uh, uh, a, uh, a disease or a contaminant or whatever, and people who are not exposed. Okay, so an odds ratio, so if the percentage of people exposed uh, uh, that get sick is, is uh, 25%, and the percentage of people who are not exposed is 25%, then the relative risk, I won't, you know, you can kind of look at these similarly. I'm not going to draw out the box. The relative risk is equal to one. It's the same rate. In other words, 0.25 over 0.25. The relative risk is equal to one. So if there's no difference between being exposed and not exposed and whether you have the condition or the disease or whatever, if there's no difference, well, then the relative risk to the odds ratios are equal to one. So our null hypothesis that there's no association between being exposed and whether or not you get sick, for instance, is uh, or uh, whether, whether you have green eyes and uh, and uh, uh, whether the blue eyes and or, or uh, green, brown eyes uh, uh, are likely to make you a blonde or a brunette or something like that. Like any two by two table, if one, in other words, the odds ratio equals one, is your null hypothesis. That's your starting point. Relative risk is equal to one. <coughs> so your your alternative hypothesis is that the odds ratio is not equal to one. In other words, different than one. So in your case here, your odds ratio is 1.2. That means that the odds of getting sick, for instance, whatever the variables happen to be, the odds of getting sick is 20% higher, 1.2 times as higher the exposed group as opposed to the unexposed group. Well, that's interesting that, you know, it suggests that there's a difference, right? But now, anytime we take a sample, we have a certain level of uncertainty that's involved. Is that really what we would get if we sampled the entire population? Uh, that would we get a different result than our sample? You know, this could have been a small sample, could have been 10 people, could have been 100 people, could have been a big sample, uh, 1,000 people. Right, we don't. I, I don't know at the moment, but in any case, any time we take a sample, there's uncertainty about whether or not our sample uh, really reflects the, the uh, entire population. So in our case, we use confidence intervals. So in this case, your confidence interval was 0.86 to 1.14. Actually, that doesn't make any sense, does it? Because if your if your odds ratio were 1.2 you would expect your confidence interval to be on either side of 1.2. Like for instance, uh, uh, we would expect it to be something like, uh, say 1.2, we would expect it might be something like 1.1 to 1.3, or uh, uh, 0.9 to 1.5, something like that. We wouldn't expect, say if our confidence interval is 0 0.86 and 0.14, we would expect that our odds ratio would have been in, in the middle there somewhere. Um, is it possible? Oh, okay, good. Ah, aha, all right, that makes sense now. Okay, so 1.2, right, was, uh, uh, where were we? 1.2 is your, is your odds ratio. Your confidence interval is 1.147 to 1.261. We're 95, uh, although our sample had an odds ratio of 1.2, the way this, the, the sample size, the way the sample is distributed uh, indicates to us that we can be pretty sure, in other words, 95% certain, that's our confidence, that we can be 95% certain that the true population mean is between 1.15 and 1.26, between those two numbers. Well, our no hypothesis was it was equal to one. An alternative hypothesis is equal, not equal to one. 
So since we have a range, our confidence interval is 1.14 to 1.26, well, now we can say with 95% certainty that it's not 1.1, it's not one, right? Because we're 95% sure it's between these two numbers. So that winds up excluding uh, uh, 1.14. 1, uh, 1 okay, so, so the, the idea here is, is that uh, we want to exclude, we want to reject on the hypothesis if we can. And, and that confidence interval tells us if we can do it with a level of certainty. Now, had our confidence interval, turn, had, had we had a result of 1.2 and our confidence interval was 0.9 to 1.4, well, we're not 95% certain then that it's not one. one. It could be one, it's in within that range of what we would expect a range for 95% confidence. So in this case, we failed to reject our null hypothesis because we can't say with that level of certainty that it's not one. With this range we, uh, for uh, confidence interval, we can say, okay, okay, so the other, uh, so you have another one, which is 0 0.86 to 0.89. Again, that excludes one, one is not in between so we can reject the null hypothesis there also. So why is one greater than one and one less than one? Okay, so let's say that we have this set up the way I just described it, exposed, not exposed, disease, and no disease. You may have noticed that in some of the classes, I, I encourage you to set it up this way. Like if there's an exposure, make it the top number and this is the bottom row. And if the disease is a disease or an outcome that you're interested in, make it the left column and the right column would be the absence of that. Uh, so I, I actually set that that way because then it would wind up with a odds ratio of relative risk where the number would, would be easy easier to interpret. So if you got it set up that way, if, if you get a result of 1.2, that means that there's an increased rit, risk with exposure, right? If you got a number that's less than one, that means that the rate that the not exposed, that the rate at the lower row is, is getting the disease is higher than the rate at the exposed row. So in other words, that might be a situation where the exposure is protective. It lowers the rate uh, uh, at which you might get the disease. Now in, in SPSS, there's ways to manipulate that. Uh, you might have to do some transforming of the data to, to, to deal with that. We don't get to that today. I'll get to it tomorrow. You know, I'm going to do a session again tomorrow night. I'll make sure I get to it tomorrow night. Okay. So I'm going to. So I'm going to go ahead and. Uh, so if there aren't any other immediate questions, I'm going to go back and take a look at some of the data sets, so you can see some of the ways that you might be able to handle this stuff. Let's close that. Does that answer your question, Mar Marcelina? Analyzing expected and observed values. <clears throat> is it, is it still? Well, we can say it's statistically significant when the test that we're using tells us there's less than a 5% chance of getting that big a difference between the two. Um, uh, <clears throat> getting five, less than a 5% chance. Uh, of getting that difference between the two strictly by chance, right? So in other words, anytime you take a sample, you always have the, the chance that your sample may mislead you because it is a sample, you may just have bad luck. So so you really, you, you have to look at, in statistics, in, in when we're using SPSS, you have to look at the significance or the p-value. That percentage tells you the likelihood you would get that 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 outcome if the null hypothesis were true. So, so if, for instance, uh, that percentage, that p-value, and I'll demonstrate this in a second, if that p-value is less than 0.05, there's less than five percent chance that you would get that outcome if the null hypothesis were true. So that's a small enough percentage that by convention, we say you can reject the null hypothesis. If that p-value said 
17%, 0.17. Well, that means that you could get that big a difference between the say the two groups or between the multiple groups. You could get that big a difference 17% of the time, even if the null hypothesis were true. Well, that's too much of a chance for us to take. We, we, our level of tolerance for risk is 5%. So since there's 17% chance of getting that result of the null hypothesis were true, then we fail to reject the null hypothesis. It's not, we haven't lowered the risk of being wrong enough to uh, 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 say that the null hypothesis is not true. <laughs> okay, I can take, actually I can do that right now. I can take a look. I can get an example here and we can take a look at the, uh, uh, the, the idea of the uh, uh, two by two tables. So for instance, let me just open one right now. Okay, I'm going to open up the uh, the uh, uh, hang on. here we are. Here's the folder here. Um, you know, I I I am in the process that I wonder if I've done it yet. Uh, let's see. I'm going to do it right now. I'm uploading another version of this data set. <clears throat> Sim the, the community health survey simplified. Okay, in this case, it includes a coded version of that file. Okay, let's see, I gotta add it here. Oh, it's already, I just added it already. Okay, it's there already. Okay, let me show this to you. Okay, get this to reload. Okay, so under New York City Community Health Survey data, uh, we have a file for, uh, uh, we have code, we have data from 2013 and data from 2017. Okay, it's a little bit more recent data. You can play with that if you want. Um, um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> you're perfectly welcome to use the 2013 data. There's a couple of reasons why that might be attractive to you. And one is, is that we've provided you with a simplified version of it. Instead of 200 variables, we narrowed it down to about 10 or 12 interesting variables, okay? And in fact, I just uploaded one also, where if I open if I open this one, for instance, you'll see the simplified version of 2013 data. If I open this one, you'll see the one I just uploaded. I'm gonna, I'm gonna open those right now. I already have them downloaded. So uh, if you wanna get them off there, of course, you would right click and say, save it as, and I could throw it up on it. For instance, I'm on my desktop. I can throw it up on my desktop. I already have a copy there. I could replace it if I want. It doesn't matter. Okay, so you can save it. So now it's on my desktop and I can work with it on my desktop. But here's a, here's a bunch of them right here. So the 2013 full data set, if I open that in SPSS, and I'm going to double click on it and open it. Um, and, um, Open up quick. And spinning, spinning. Here we go. I think that's it. Here we go. Okay, so here is the data set. Look how many variables are on. There's more than 200 variables, I think. And if I go into the variable, you know, they're, all, they're all coded as numbers, right, as values. In some cases, for instance, demog1, <clears throat> I believe, <clears throat> excuse me, I believe demog1 is age, right? Look, it's a numerical variable. There are a couple of missing values here, but I think it's a, it's a numerical variable and it represents age. And in fact, if I go to the variable view, I can see that each one of these rows corresponds to a column in the uh, data view. So if I go to the variable view, I can look up demog1, here's demog1, and I can go over here and under the label, it has the question, what is the question is. And the question is, what is your age? So in fact, I can see that it is a scalar variable, it is a number, right? So uh, we, we can deal with that, we can work with that. Okay, so now the other thing that I notice is, is that a lot of these others are nominal variables. They have values. For instance, in the past 12 months, 
Oops. I can grab this just like Excel and spread it out. In the past 12 months, have you taken a, pre a prescription medication for mental health problem? Okay. Oh, okay. So let's take a look at mood nine. Well, mood nine, if I look over here, is mood nine. Mood nine is numbers. It's two, one. So how do we know what those numbers mean? Well, the way we know what those numbers mean is that along with this data set, there is a code book for uh, uh, 2013. So I'm going to open that code book. It's a PDF file. And here's my code book. And this code book tells me, let me get rid of that. This code book tells me what all these questions represent. So for instance, is uh, all these variable names, right? These are the variable names. You can then find out from the code book what those numbers mean. One means yes, two means no. So for mood nine, <clears throat> I can, I can uh, since I have this open, I can search it. I'm going to click command F. I'm going to search for mood nine, the variable name. And you could actually just, if you wanted to, you could just spin through this whole thing uh, if you wanted to, but it's easier, quicker to do it this way. So let's see what mood nine is mood six. I came up with a lot more than I needed. Not sure what, oh, here it is, here's mood nine. Mood nine, in the past of all, have you, have you taken prescription medication for mental problem? Mood nine, the answer one is yes. Now, SPSS is going to ignore these two other ones with the dots in front of them, so you don't have to worry about them. But mood, uh, mood nine, the values are one for yes and two for no. So I'm going to go over here to my data set, and now I'm going to go back to my variable view, and I'm going to go take a look at mood nine, and under values, I'm going to click in there, right? Right now there's nothing there. I'm going to click in there. And I'm going to click this little box that comes up on side of it. And now I can tell SPSS that the value one, oops, uh, I got something in my way here. Let me try that again. The value one equals took medication. And the value two represents did not take medication. Yeah, I could have just called that yes and no also. Okay, the other thing I could do is <clears throat> I could, if I want mood nine, I could simplify this um, uh, uh, phrase because this is going to turn up all my charts and stuff like that. So I could go in there and I could, instead of put, leaving it this whole long description of exactly what the question wants, I could uh, put in there instead, instead, uh, 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 Mental, let's see, I'm going to highlight this whole thing. Mental health medication. Okay, so when I when I create my charts, I can, the title is going to be mental health medication. <clears throat> and then the axes is going to be whether they took it or didn't take it. So it'll be a little bit easier to work with. So that's how you would, what we call code the data. You need the code book. So you can look at what the values are. If I go back to data view now, you'll notice that instead of just ones and twos, you can actually see the values for each subject that we uh, 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 that was in this uh, study. So <clears throat> I'm going to go over here and I'm going to say, uh, let's see, I'm, also going to, I'm going to go back here and do another one of these. Okay, I'm going to go to variable view and let's see. We, we have a numerical variable, which is what is your age? Uh, uh, oh, uh, let's see. Let me just pick one more out here. Let's see. I'm going to take borough of residence. Okay. And I'll bet you I know that, that that's going to have five values. I don't think so. Right. But borough of residence. Here we go. Look, one, two, three, four. I don't see five too often. Five. I'm, I'm going to bet. Five is Staten Island because it doesn't come very, very often. So those are boroughs, right? So now I, I'm going to go back to my variable view and I'm going to say, gee, um, 
my variable view for let's see borough oh of residents i'm just going to change that to borough that's enough i think we know we'll know what it means just if we just say borough right and then in the values i have to tell it what those values represent how do i know which number it is and, you know i guess number five is that and i don't think it can come over very often but i'm going to go over here and i'm going to look up i'm going to command f again I'm going to do a search on my PDF file for borough or borough of residence because I know that was in the question, so that should help me find it. And here it is it's borough of residence, the variable name is borough. One is the Bronx, two is Brooklyn, three is Manhattan, four is Queens, and five is Staten Island, as I had guessed. Okay, so I'm going to fill in my one is the Bronx. Two is Brooklyn. Three, I think, was Manhattan. Let me go back. Let me go back to a quick look. Three was Manhattan. Four was Queens. And five was Staten Island. Anybody know what the real name for Staten Island is? I'm going to call it. I, I, I'm going to stay with Staten Island. It's Richmond. Okay. So now I've coded a couple of variables. Uh, I've coded. I know that this var variable is numeric. It's the age. In fact, let me just go back there for a second. And over here, where it says. Where was Demog? Demog one, what is your age? Right? I'm gonna change that to just age, right? A little bit easier to remember. There we go. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my data view. Okay, so now at this stage, if you really want to get if you really want to uh, work around this a little bit uh, easier, a little bit easier. You can just work with the way it is. Or, you know, if I, these variables that I'm not using, or these new variables that I may not be interested in right now, I can actually highlight those. And I can go up to edit and I can say, let's see, my delete. I can say clear. And they go away. I don't have them. But the only thing is, I got to remember to save my data set, save as. And I'm going to, we're not going to do that for a few more of these just to make it easier to work with. You don't have to do it if you don't want to, but it's going to make it a little easier for us to work with it. Clear, demog1 is still there. Okay, uh, all these others I, I'm going to get rid of. Just for the one, I'm just keeping the ones I'm going to work with today, right now, for what we're doing right now. And the rest of these, gee, I'm not going to, I'm not going to need these, I don't think, for a while. And in fact, I'm going to go scroll all the way over and eliminate everything. Let's have the variables I'm going to work with. You don't have to do this, but it sure makes things a little, especially with this big data set, the full data set, it makes it a little easier to work with. So I'm going to save this right now. I'm going to say save as, and I'm going to save this to the desktop. And I'm going to say instead of full data, data set, I'm going to say working data set for today. Today is 05, what's today's date? Today is the 19th, 051919. Okay. So I'm going to save that to my desktop. Uh, well, I'm in this folder over here. Actually, I'll leave saving it to this folder where I had saved all the other stuff. OK, so now let's see how I would approach analyzing this. Let's say that I wanted to know whether the average age of people who took medication is different from the average age of people who didn't take medication. Can anyone want to hazard a guess for me? What kind of variable is whether or not you took medication? Who nine? What kind of variable is that? Okay, it was it was recorded as a number in the data view, right? I can actually go back and I can turn off. The value label so you can actually see the numbers behind the scenes there 
or turn that back on. Right, it's a categorical variable. And what kind of variable was the age? It's a numerical variable. So one of the things I might be able to look at is whether or not these two values for numerical variable, whether or not there's a difference in the average age for people who took medication versus people who didn't take medication. So when we have two groups uh, in our categorical variable, took medication or didn't take medication, and I want to find the difference, whether or not there's a difference in the mean age and the mean of the numerical variable associated with them, <clears throat> what kind of test do I use for uh, testing two means? And what has, has a guess? T-test, exactly, great. So I'm gonna go up here to analyze, right? I'm gonna go up there to analyze, and I'm gonna say, compare means, and go to independent, it's not a one sample t-test. I'm not, it's not like I'm taking the, uh, the average age of people who took the medication and comparing it to a number I have in my head, like 50, is it over 50, under 50? Then that would be a one sample t-test because I'm only looking at the ones who took medication. If I want to compare the two groups to each other, I would go to independent samples t-test, okay? And the test variable is going to be the mean that I'm looking for. In other words, the mean age, that would, that's where we're going there. The grouping variable would be the, uh, uh, the, uh, the categorical variable I'm splitting up the two means into. So that would be mental health, yes or no, whether it took medication, yes or no. We're gonna put that in there. That wants me to define the group so that it knows whether or not, uh, uh, what were the numbers behind the scenes? Not, the, not those words, but the numbers behind the scenes. Let me just take a quick look back there. Well, it's ones and twos. Okay, so I'm going to back here. If you happen to have a better memory than me, you're younger, you probably have better memory than I do. You would remember that it was ones and twos. That we, That's the way we coded it, right? You, that's how, those are the numbers that I assigned to. So now what's going to happen is it's going to find the average age broken up into people who took medication versus people who didn't take medication for mental health and click OK. And we're going to do our analysis. OK, so here's our t-test. So there are 810 people took medication. 7,600 did not take medication. The average age for people who took medication for mental health issues is 53. And the average, pe the average people who did not take it is 48. Now we have some information here about the variability. So now the question is, what's our null hypothesis here? A null hypothesis is the mean for people who took medication is different from the mean for people who didn't take medication. Well, it looks like it from this, doesn't it? But is that statistically significant? In other words, is do I have enough data to say that that's really true for the entire population in New York City, or did I just get unlucky and get this outcome uh, because of our sample? Well, that's why we do a t-test. Here's our t-test. So our t-test would indicate to us, okay, so first thing I see over here is this f-test and significance. This part here is only to help you decide whether or not you can say, whether or not you can assume equal variances or whether or not you should assume unequal variances. For our purposes, I'm going to say stick with equal variances in this case because uh, the, the variability is, is pretty close. Okay, but you know we can use this to interpret this. You might actually suggest because this is less than 0.05 that maybe you should equal variance not soon. But I think the top line is probably going to be a less uh, rigorous, a, a more rigorous test. You can see the t, t value comes out lower for it. So here's our t value. That's a big t value. Usually the t, t values that we're dealing with, similar to z scores, are like you know one and a half, two, three. If there's really big difference. A big number. Let's go across here and see what's the probability, what's the p-value or significance. The probability we get that this big a difference, 53%, 53 years to 48 years, this big a difference if the null hypothesis is true that the, the means of the two populations are actually equal to one another. Right? Okay, let's see, we go across here. The probability we get that outcome is less than 0 0.001. They show it as zero, but it's not really ever zero. It's less than 0 0.001. So since that is less than 0.05, less than 5%, there's less than a 5% chance 
given the sample size that we have, there's less than a 5% chance that you would get this big a difference if the population means were equal. In other words, if the null hypothesis were true. So since there's less than a 5% chance we would get this big a difference, we can say, oh, gee, indeed, I can reject the idea that they're equal and say that they're unequal. In other words, accept my alternative hypothesis. Does that make sense to you guys? Are you guys comfortable with that? I'll wait for a reply. I want to make sure, I want to make sure that, I, that I, I'm picking you on this journey that we're going on, that you guys are on it with me. Okay, kind of makes sense, right? Okay, so now, the only thing is there's not very many of these, uh, uh, there's not, I, got, uh, I got a reply from a student. Uh, uh, the other guys didn't see that, but I actually did get a reply, so I'm moving on. It was just addressed to me instead of everybody. But you can address it to, uh, you know, we're, not, we're all in the same boat here. Okay, I'm, I'm hoping the rest of you guys are, are with me on this, okay? So at any rate, so now that I've done this, now that I've done this with this variable, you know, I'm going to go back here and look, look at this data, this data that I'm working with here. You know, a lot of the data in the original file, you may have noticed a lot of it when, when we listed it, a lot of it was categorical variables, not, numer not numerical variables. In fact, there were very few age, there were a few others, but not a whole lot of uh, numerical variables. While I'm on numerical variables, I'm going to do something else. How about is the average age of people in each of these boroughs equal? In other words, um, uh, uh, the people are people in Manhattan on the average older than people in Staten Island? Are people in Brooklyn older than people in the Bronx, for instance? Well, okay, what would our null hypothesis be? Well, the problem here is, is that instead of here on medication where it's either took it or didn't take it, two possibilities, instead here, there's five possibilities. They could be living in any of five boroughs. So I have an average age for Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, and wherever I miss. Okay, Bronx. Yeah, I, I'm gonna get to Chi-Square. I'm gonna do this first. I'm gonna get to Chi, because I have this available. I'm gonna get to Chi-Square in a second. So, so I have five averages that I can compare. Okay, so you can use a t-test and say, I'll compare Brooklyn to Manhattan if that's all you're interested in. Right, or so on and so forth, you want to compare. We know we can use the t-test to do that. Well, if I have more than two values here, right, if I have more than two values in my categorical variable, I would have to repeat the t-test over and over again. We have a different tool for that. Analyze, compare means, and I'm going to go down to one-way analysis of variance. So in this case, I'm going to move my dependent, my, the value I'm finding the average of, which is age, and now the factors, the groups I'm breaking that up into, instead of mental health, which was a yes or no, only two categories, I'm gonna look at it by borough. So I'm gonna move that in here. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and run my analysis, my analysis of variance. It's gonna calculate an F value in statistics for, for analysis of variance. And first of all, let's look at the data here. Let's see if we see something here, okay. Okay, here's our analysis of variance. Our analysis of variance, well, first, you know, before I did that, I could do that. Uh, no, I'm going to, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do something quickly. I'm going to go to descriptive statistics and explore. Explore because I want to break it up into different groups. I'm going to put age in here. I'm going to put borough in here. And I'm going to tell SPSS that I wanted to calculate everything, including the confidence interval. So I'm going to click OK. And I'm going to produce a bunch of descriptive statistics, meaning I'm going to ask SPSS to give me information on what the average age for each of these groups is. For the Bronx, the average age is 47. In Brooklyn, it's 46. In Manhattan, it's 52. Boy, old guys in Manhattan. Queens is 48, so on and so forth. So we have all five boroughs here that we've gotten the descriptive statistics for. Question now is, can I say with 95% certainty that the average age in Bronx is different than Brooklyn and Manhattan and so on and so forth. So I'm going to do my analysis of variance. I'm going to repeat it again now. Analyze, compare means, one-way analysis of variance, 
I'm going to do it again. I already still have the values left in there, so I don't have to worry about that. So I'm going to go over here and say to myself, okay. I'm going to say to myself, okay, so what did my statistic come out to be? It came out to be 41 uh, uh, for the number of degrees of freedom that we're dealing with here. Okay, so my 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 um, uh, analysis of variance tells me that my null hypothesis, which is the mean for Brooklyn is equal to the mean for Queens is equal to the mean for Bronx is equal to the mean for Staten Island, and so on and so forth, that all of the means are equal. That's my null hypothesis. My uh, uh, my alternative hypothesis is is that not all of the means are equal. Not that not that they're all different, but not all of them are equal. At least at least two of them are different. So can I reject my null hypothesis? So my analysis of variance, my significance, there's a calculation for analysis of variance. I won't go over that completely now. My statistic for analysis of variance is equal to 41 for this number degrees of freedom, four degrees of freedom. That's a five by one, five by two table. Okay, so I'm now for five, that's five, five degrees, four degrees of freedom for number groups and, the, and uh, this number of degrees of freedom for number of people in it and so on. So my F score is 41, my analysis of variance value is 41. The probability that we would get that big a number if my null hypothesis was true, if all of these means are equal, it's 0 0.001. Again, very, very tiny and certainly less than 5%. Since the probability that I would get such a big difference in the mean ages is so small, I can reject the null hypothesis and say that there is a difference between the means of these five groups. Now the question becomes, where's the difference? Is it between Bronx and Brooklyn or, or uh, Staten Island and Manhattan and so on and so forth? So now I can go up here and I can say, analyze, and go back to exactly the same spot, compare means, one-way analysis of variance. Now I can go into here to this tab post -op. and I can tell it to do a test after I've shown that I can reject an null hypothesis and not before, right? But you gotta do that first for it. After that, I can run one of these uh, post hoc tests, after the fact tests. And I can say Bonferroni, for instance, or 2P, I would stick to those two for your purposes. And I think either one will work for you. But there's, a, but there's reason behind which, why would you use any particular one of these? Those are both relatively conservative test and I think you can use those pretty safely. So I'm going to use Von Froni. I'm going to click continue. So it's going to come up as a table that, uh, let's click OK. It's going to come up as a table that summarizes what the probability of, uh, of that big difference in outcome would be for all of the comparisons between boroughs. So if I compare Brooklyn uh, to the Bronx, the difference is not great enough for me to reject the null hypothesis. It's greater than 0.05, the significance of p-value. And notice the confidence interval includes uh, uh, the, number, uh, the number one. So Bronx and Manhattan, how about that? Well, yeah, that's a significant enough difference. You might notice Manhattan's probably gonna be different than everybody. Bronx and Manhattan, that is different. I can reject the null hypothesis. No. How about Bronx and Queens? No, I can't quite reject the null hypothesis for uh, Queens and, and the Bronx, because they're not far enough. But about Bronx and Staten Island, yes, I can reject a hypothesis. And then you can go through all the different combinations and determine which of these will let you uh, 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 reject a hypothesis for uh, whether or not you, uh, for whether or not the means for each individual borough uh, is different. So, are we okay with that? That's how you would use a, a work in a situation where. You're, you're comparing averages for more than one value in the categorical variable. Borough is categorical, age was numerical. Uh, we looked at the difference in average age for each group in, within that categorical variable. And this is what, how you would determine that. First, you do the analysis of variance. And then uh, if you can reject it on hypothesis, you go on and do the post hoc test to see which of them are different. Okay, I'm hoping that's okay with you guys. Again, if you can just comment or or just give me a heads up that like you guys are following me, that would be great. Okay, so now I got a question about chi square. Before I, I'm going to approach that right now. By the way, one of the benefits of doing this in SPSS is we get box plots. 
So we can see the median value in age for the Bronx is this. We can see just at a glance, the median value for age is highest, in other words, the oldest population, as far as the median is concerned, is in Manhattan. And we can see Brooklyn and the Bronx are very close. Hence, we weren't rejected, no, no hypothesis. Right? So, so, and you want to know something else? Manhattan and Staten Island, they're pretty close. Well, Staten Island and, and Manhattan, they're pretty close. I wonder, were we able to reject the no hypothesis there? Let's see, Manhattan and Staten Island. No, we weren't able to reject the null hypothesis. We can kind of see that, that they were very close here as well. And so, uh, so it kind of gives you a heads up on what you might expect. And this is a nice graphical way to show the differences. Okay, so uh, how about chi-square? Okay, well, chi-square, uh, the important thing is not chi-square, but what you're using chi-square for. So let's say that I wanted to determine whether or not people in Manhattan, people in different boroughs, took medication for mental health illnesses uh, at a different rate, at a different percentage. So I have a categorical, categorical variable borough, five categories, and I have a categorical variable whether or not they took medication, which is two values. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and take that. And I'm gonna analyze that. And the analysis I use for categorical, categorical situations is I go into analyze and I go into descriptive statistics, uh, which is kind of an odd place to hide it. I'm going to go over here down to cross tabs because I'm going to create a cross tabs table, rows and columns, sometimes called the contingency table. I'm going to open that up, and in the rows, I am going to put the exposure, and in the columns, I'm going to put the outcome. So my exposure is 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 a borough. In other words, <clears throat> which borough? I'm going to compare borough to borough to borough to borough in terms of whether they're likely to take medication or not. And in the columns, I'm going to put whether they took medication or didn't take medication. Okay, a little, it's sometimes a little, when you're dealing with disease or not disease, a little easier to interpret what goes in the columns and rows. But in our case, the exposure is borough. In other words, Brooklyn, we're going to compare Brooklyn to the Bronx, to Manhattan, to Staten Island. So we have all of those rows. And the columns is yes or, yes or no, they took the medication. Okay, so there's a number of ways I can do this. I can do this all at once. I'm going to go through it one step at a time, <clears throat> but you can actually check off all these values all at once if you want. So I'm going to go into cells, and I'm going to say, I want to see the observed values. That's the only thing checked off right now. I click that, and I click OK, and the output will come up. And here's the output. And the output shows me, well, in the Bronx, 157 people out of 1,500 took medication. In Brooklyn, 216 out of 2,300. Manhattan, Queens, Staten Island. And uh, did I just say, let me take a look. I, don't know, I, I wouldn't worry. So we're only doing, I, I, we're all sticking to one layer. So I, I don't want to complicate things too much. So let's, let's not worry about that for now. Uh, but you can do multiple. You can take multiple, there are multiple ways that you can look at this data, or if there are other variables that influence this as well. Okay, so I don't want to, I don't want to, I, I'm avoiding that right now. Maybe at some point, you know, like uh, uh, after after we're done with all this work or something like that, we can uh, kind of, uh, I can go kind of go back over uh, some of the uh, projects or something like that, and, and we can bring it up then. Okay, so Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens, Staten Island. Okay, so let's get another look at this thing. If I really wanted to, I could go up to analyze. I didn't mean to shut down the question, but I, I, we have a limited amount of time. I want to make sure I cover everything as, as much as I can. So let's go to cross steps. Okay, so now, you know, uh, I, went into, I went into cells. I said, give me the observed values. I could also ask it to give me the expected values too. And I'll click OK, and let's see what the difference, what it looks like. Well, here, now for the Bronx, we've got not only got 157, which was the exact number of people in our sample that took medication, but we also got the number 151.5, which is what we would have expected if everyone was taking it at the same rate. 
Here, to, here's the totals. So 822 out of 8,600 people, or I, I don't know, what does that look like? That looks like about, uh, about, about 10% of the people were taking medication. So if 10% of these people were taking medication, this is the number that I would have expected to see there. Notice the expected values are not always round numbers, right? Because look, it's uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.5. But you know the, the, uh, the actual values, the actual count, the, the observed values are always going to be whole numbers because you're counting actual people. You're not going to have half a person, right? But you can have half a person when you do it by calculation. Okay, so I can do that if I want. I'm going to go back. I'm going to analyze descriptive statistics. I'm going to go to uh, uh, cross tabs again. This time I'm going to go into cells. You know, I'm going to turn off expected values for now. I'm going to do percentages by rows. What is that going to do for me? Let's take a look. Do a percentage by rows. Now the table I produce tells me not only that we had 157 in, uh, out of 1596 in the Bronx, but that represents 9.8% of the people in the Bronx that were surveyed are taking medication for, men, uh, for mental health issues or did during that course of that year. In Manhattan, 12%, a higher percentage were taking medication for mental health illnesses that year. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? First of all, what's remarkable is almost 10% of the people in New York City are taking some medication for a mental health issue. That's pretty damn interesting, right? And now I can see that, wow, Manhattan, well, what, what's going on there? Perhaps people in Manhattan are more affluent, maybe have access to better health care. I'll leave that up to you to speculate about, right? So, so how about Brooklyn, Brooklyn? So my no hypothesis here is that there's no association between the borough you live in and how likely it is that you're going to take medication for a mental health issue. You know, it's looking like maybe that's not true, that maybe I can reject the no hypothesis. Well, at this stage, we are going to, we're going to do a statistical test to show that. And the statistical test that we're going to show is called chi-square. As you know, we've done that before. We're going to compare these. So my null hypothesis is there's no association between borough and whether or not you take mental health uh, uh, drugs for mental health and uh, mental health issues. And uh, my alternative hypothesis that there is an association. Okay, so let's give that a try. Analyze descriptive statistics cross steps again. That's where we're going to find it. Okay, and under statistics, I'm going to ask it to calculate the chi-square value. And I'll click continue. You know, I'm going to also add, I'm going to click off risk, so I don't waste any time. Like risk would be odds ratio and relative risk, but we're going to get an error when we do that. And I think some of you probably already know why I'm going to get an error. So I'm going to click OK, and there we go. It comes up in here that they repeated the test. And then it comes up here. My chi square value is 29.87 with four degrees of freedom. Why four degrees of freedom? Five rows minus one is four times uh, two columns minus one is one, four times one is four. So that looks right. My chi square value, my Pearson's chi square value is 0 0.000. Again, less, you're going to get that result quite a bit here because this data set is enormous. It's 8,000 people. So, you, so you frequently, if you're going to be able to reject the null hypothesis, you're going to get a, a very low value for significance or p value. Or likelihood of being uh, of getting that big a difference. So in this case, I can see that there is an association between. Uh, I can reject the hypothesis. There's no association, and accept the alternative hypothesis that there is an association between the worry you live in and how likely you are to take uh, uh, medication. And in fact, I can see if I go back to my table, I can see relatively. Which, which, where the rates are highest and lowest by looking at my percentages by rows. Now, I also said odds ratio. Uh, the only problem is if you look down here, risk estimate, in other words, odds of relative risk, right? They only work for a two by two table in SPSS. So we would have to work with a two by two table here. Well, unfortunately, I don't, I, you know, that's a, this is, two, this is two values, but the borough is five values. Is there any way for me to get around that? If you want to know something, maybe there is a way for me to get around that. I'm going to create a new variable. 
and that new variable is going to be, let's see, I'm gonna transform, and I'm gonna say recode into different variables. That means I'm gonna create a new variable from an existing variable, recode into different variables. So here we get a window comes up here, and it says input variable and output variable. Well, the variable I'm starting with is borough. I don't want five values, I only want two values, right? So let's say I only want to compare Manhattan to Queens, right? Okay, so I'm going to say my new variable, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna first of all, I'm gonna give it a name. I'm gonna say uh, Manhattan v Queens, right? That's gonna be the name of my new variable. And the conditions I'm gonna have is the old and new values, okay? The old value I had, I'm not gonna have to remember this stuff. Uh, Manhattan. I don't remember what Manhattan was. Let me see. Let's, let's go to view. I can't change it though. I'm gonna cancel this for a second. I gotta cancel. I gotta add. So I, I said Manhattan and Queens. I can't still go to that now. Value labels. Okay, so here's Queens. Queens is four. Queens is four, and Manhattan is one, I think. No, Queens is four. And Manhattan is three. Three and four are the two, va two values that I'm interested in. Okay, so I'm gonna go back here again. All the new values, three and four. Okay, so in my new variable, in my new variable, right, the value three, three is going to become three in the new variable. I'm gonna add that. Okay, and the value four is gonna become the value, actually tell you the truth, I got an even better way to do this, okay? The value three is going to become the value one in, that's the three is Manhattan, I think, right? It's gonna become the value one in my new variable, okay? And the value, Four is going to be going to kind of value two in my new variable. That's queens. Okay, and that's it. I'm not going to copy over any of the other variables. Just those two, and I'm recoding them into new numbers. Didn't have to. I could have kept them three or four if I wanted to, but why not? Okay, just give you another look at what you might do with this. Okay, so I can set conditions on this, filters, and so on. So I'm not going to bother with that. I'm just going to go over here and click change. And now notice that darkened, and I'm gonna say, uh, I'm gonna go over here, and I'm just gonna repeat that for the uh, label, what, what it's gonna use on the graph. I'm gonna click okay, and voila, I now have a new variable with only ones and twos in it, right? So only Manhattan and Queens in it. So I'm gonna click the variable view, and I'm going to say, there's no label there, so I'm going to say Manhattan and Queens. Should have been ever, I don't know why I did Manhattan and Queens. Okay, and the values. Well, there's only two values here. The value one represents Manhattan. Because that's the way I did it. Could have been, it could have been three or four. We could have kept it three and four. And the value two represents Queens. And I'm going to click OK. I'm going to repeat my chi-square analysis with different variables now. I'm going to go up to Analyze, Descriptive Statistics, Cross Tabs, and now instead of Borough, right? Okay, I'm going to use my new variable Manhattan Queens. So if I'm right in the rows, I'm going to have two rows Manhattan and Queens, and in the columns, I'm going to have two outcomes takes medication or doesn't take medication. So I'm going to go up to cells. This time I'm going to leave everything turned on. I only have to do it once. So I'm going to click OK. OK, and here's our new table. Our new table says, again, we already knew this, right? 12.2% of people in Manhattan taking medication. Only 7.3% of the people in Queens are taking medication. And notice now it's a two by two table at this point. What about our chi-square? Well, chi-square number comes out very high, so our null hypothesis is 
that there's no association between living in Manhattan and Queens and whether or not you take medication. The alternative hypothesis is that there is an association. Well, let's see, can I reject the null hypothesis that there's no association? Well, yes, the significance is less than 0.05, so I can reject my null hypothesis. How about my odds ratio? Well, now I can calculate an odds ratio at a relative risk. Just so you know, the relative risk is just 12.2%, in other words, 250 over 2040, which is 12.2%, divided by uh, 141 over 1938, which is 7.3%, 12.2% over 7.3% is about 1.5. If I go down here, I will see my risk estimates. Here's for cohort method. That's my odds ratio, uh, my relative risk right there. My odds ratio is 250 over 1804 divided by 141 over 1797. So my odds ratio, odds, is 1.766. And my, my uh, 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 odds ratio, excuse me, my relative risk is 1.673. First, first one you get is obvious. It says odds is my odds ratio. Second one I get is 1.673. So what does that tell me? People who live in Manhattan are 1.7 or 1.8 times as li more likely to be taking medication for mental health Ill illness than people in Queens, right? Now, what's my null hypothesis for odds ratio? You could either, uh, you know, mo in most studies, you, uh, you see them report odds, right? There's reasons for that. You know, that there's a variety of reasons for that, that they use that more frequently in studies because it's related to the sample size. In other words, uh, how, likely, uh, how likely you are to be able to reject the null hypothesis for different sample sizes, how descriptive it is, different sample sizes. For the most part, they'll usually be pretty close. And for the most part, you can reject the null hypothesis for odds ratio, you can generally reject it for, yeah, it's uh, almost, I think it might be certain, but it's certainly very, very likely you're gonna be able to reject it for relative risk. I, 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 uh, without thinking about it harder, I'm not sure if I could say that absolutely, but I, I think you can. But anyway, so which one would you report? Most papers report odds ratio, use odds ratio, but to be honest with you, from a person, from a perspective of someone who is not a, a scientist, relative risk is a little easier to understand. So relative risk, if 12.6, 12.2% of the people are here and 7.3% of the people, just have to divide that risk into that risk by that risk, and you get that 1.6. And you can say that the risk of getting of, of having to take the, these drugs is higher in Manhattan, is 1.67 times higher in Manhattan. On the other hand, the odds are 1.76 times higher. But odds are a little bit harder complex, uh, a little harder concept to wrap your head around. You remember that uh, 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 it's the number of people that had the disease minus uh, over the number of people that didn't get the disease in each of the two groups, they're a little harder, a little less intuitive. So to be honest with you, a lot of times when you read the results of a study in a newspaper, they'll report the risk. The risk is twice as great if you smoke or five times as great if you smoke. But in, in a lot of scientific papers, they'll use the odds ratio instead. You can report both if you want, right? So, and they're usually pretty similar. Now, can I reject the null hypothesis? What's my null hypothesis for odds ratio? Well, if there's no difference in the rate at which people are taking medication in these two boroughs, well, then my odds ratio is equal to one, right? The risk or the odds are both the same in, in each of the two boroughs. So my null hypothesis is the odds ratio is equal to one. My alternative hypothesis is the odds ratio is not equal to one. So how can I decide whether or not this is a big enough odds ratio to reject an all hypothesis? Remember, it's never gonna come out exactly one, right? So this case came up to 1.7. Is that a big enough difference from one for me to reject an all hypothesis? Well, to know that, I need to look at the confidence interval for that 1.76. And since the null hypothesis is the odds ratio is equal to one, the confidence interval is important to me. I want it to be not one. 
but to reject it all hypothesis. So 95% confidence interval is telling me that I'm 95% sure that this is, remember, this is for the sample. The confidence interval tells me where I'm 95% sure the true population odds ratio is. So I'm 95% sure the true population odds ratio is between 1.4 and 2.2. 1.4 and 2.2, that means that one is outside of my 95% confidence interval. So I'm that certain that it's not one, right? So I can reject my null hypothesis. Had this come out to be 0.8 and 2.1, 0.8 and 2.1, then I can't be confident that it's not one because it could be one, it's inside my confidence interval. So I failed, I would have failed to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so that's the approach I would take to this. Now I have posted another version of uh, a lot of these, a lot of the files that you have on uh, that are available to you. Like, actually, some people started using them. There's interesting data sets that include hair color and eye color, uh, eye flicker frequency, and data and cholesterol. And there's a framing hand study, which is a big hard study. Uh, in, in, a, in a lot of those, you're going to have to code the the data that's in there. Yeah, right here's the code book. Here's the data itself, this is all on Blackboard, uh, so on and so forth. What I've done is I've added another file to Blackboard for the Community Health, uh, Community Health Survey for 2013. And that file is a coded version. In other words, the version you had before is uncoded. I added another version of it, which is coded. So if you're having trouble getting code, uh, get, working with this, I, I see a question, I'll get to it in just a second. Uh, if you're having trouble interpreting that, or figuring out how to code this, you can fall back on that copy. Now you don't have to stop your question. You can type them in there. It's not going to disappear. It's just I I I'm, I need to want to get this open and show show you the coded version of this. Up, oh, hang on a second. I had some sort of problem there. Oh, something crashed here. Hang on. Did it open? Oh, let me try this again. Uh, Oops. Okay, here we go. Here's a variable view. Notice that I have a whole bunch of different things here coded. Neighborhood, borough, uh, so on and so forth. Right now you don't see those, whether a person's insured, yes or no, type of insurance that they have, so on and so forth, whether or not they got a uh, influenza vaccine, what their gender was, or are they U.S. born? That's called nativity. Uh, 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 do they have? Ch I don't know if, if they have children or not. Children. I don't even remember what that one is. But if you go to the variable view, you can see what all the values are. For instance, this one we know is age, so we don't have anything in there. It's just a scalar variable. But this one, borough, so you can see what each of those numbers represents. Um, um, uh, U.S. born nativity. Well, one represents U.S. born, two represents foreign born, uh, children, uh, uh, let's see what that, what that is. Okay, one is none, two says is in the number of children that they might have more than three. This is a categorical variable, keep that in mind, because not, it's not a numerical variable because it's categories. None, one, two, three, in fact, four, <laughs> two, three, five is more than three, and so on. So it's a categorical variable. Okay, so, so these are all nominal. So you can actually go to the data view and go up to view and turn on value labels, click on value labels, and you can actually see them there. If you don't want to see, you want to see actual numbers, you can go here. So you can use that in a pinch. If you're having trouble figuring out how to code something, you can use this data set instead. Okay, so let's see. Questions. Uh, which one before? I think I answered that one. The chi-square, if my chi-square is greater than 3.0, we actually keep in mind that 3.81 was for for one degree of freedom for a two by two table. For if in our case we had a five by two table for the boroughs, so a five by two table, you would have to go to the chi square chart, look up what the critical value which you have to exceed, and instead of 3.81, it might be four and a half or five or something like that. Okay, in this case, uh, in this case, uh, we had such a gigantic number like 27, wasn't even close. So really, if you're going to use SPSS, you really don't have to worry about that. 
because SPSS will calculate the chi-square value and the significance or the p-value, that significance will tell you whether or not you can reject the null hypothesis if it's less than 0.05. Okay, that makes sense. You guys comfortable with that? Okay, so I'm gonna call it a day. Uh, I'm gonna be back tomorrow night at nine o'clock, same time, same channel. Okay, so not same time, but same channel. Okay, and uh, I don't know if you guys, if you guys, uh, the original Batman was on TV. Uh, uh, it was kind of like a pop art kind of show, it was a goofy kind of show. Uh, and uh, they'd always be trying, Batman and Robin always be trading puns and stuff like that. But uh, at the end of the show, because it was a weekly show, they'd say, we'll see you back here, same bat time, same bat channel. Right? Well, in this case, not same time, but the same channel. Right? So, okay, good. So I'll put the recording of this, and if you need to go back to it, and um, uh, 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 maybe I'll see you tomorrow night, or maybe I'll see you on Tuesday night, or maybe I'll see you online tomorrow night. Or maybe I'll see you on Tuesday night. So good luck, guys. Keep working on this stuff and go back and finish up your assignments also. And I warned you guys about this a million times that you get to the end of the semester, you're not going to want to have to deal with the city program thing. But now it's the end of the semester and the, and the uh, uh, chickens have come home to roost, as they say. So I need you to complete that. I can wait until probably Thursday, maybe at the absolute, absolute latest. Right, but so you can get this done first. So concentrate on this first. But I do need you to get those in because it's a required part of the course. Take care, guys. Have a good day. Have a good rest of Sunday. Bye.